Okay. Actually, you know what? I mean, look here. I think uh, the attendees have grown quite a bit. So uh, we're going to get things underway here. Um, and then uh, I have a little bit of my part, but we'll also during that a few more people can join in. So first off, thank you, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, apologies for the, set, the break we had in the middle there, but between vacation and summer schedules, we had a few people reach out to us and ask if they could have a bit of a space. So um, here we are today wrapping up the five part series. And I just want to say, uh, thank you for everybody who's been uh, who's been attending this through uh, through with us, and uh, it's been really neat to actually get to know people over the events um, and during presentations. And uh, the one thing that I want to mention as well uh, for everybody that's participated and been part of this uh, tonight after tonight's networking event, uh, we will be randomly drawing uh, the winner uh, for. Um, the $100 gift card for people attending. So thank you again and excited to see uh, who gets to pick that up. Um, we can probably use it to restock some of the amazing things we've had to try and uh, get to experience over the last little bit. Uh, so to just to get things under, underway, uh, we're day five of the five part series here. So a lot of this is familiar to you as well now. Um, in terms of format, please feel free to share the questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to hold answers to the end of the session uh, when we will uh, direct any questions you may have to uh, Jason and team and the CDW team to help answer there. Uh, we will be recording this, so a, present, a recording of the presentation will be made available. And then if you have further questions, uh, more of so specific pricing questions or anything that may be more specific to actually getting a pricing or uh, detailed information in front of you, feel free to reach out to your CDW account manager uh, or to myself or Mackenzie even, and we'll make sure that uh, the team will get you in contact with the right people and in the right place. So uh, you're familiar with this slide by now for, uh, for CDW, CDW Canada, but I just want to quickly touch base on this again. Nine offices across the country, uh, you know, co-workers everywhere available to help you and work with you, uh, specifically within security practice, like over 100 secu dedicated security uh, co-workers. So, would be more than happy to help you with anything you need, need there. Uh, for today's session, actually, it's a really interesting session. I'm super excited to have Ben talk about the session we have here. Um, a really big item for me here is the concept of rapidly changing threat types. Uh, what stands out for me in this one, especially as we talk about SASE and uh, the Palo Alto suite and how we're pivoting, combined with what everybody has just gone through with the new work from home initiatives and just the rapid change we've seen in the last few months in the landscape. Uh, this makes it even extremely relevant to me and I find this extremely interesting. Uh, some of the things that Palo Alto is pioneering here and that we've seen and some of the problems that we've been able to solve with Palo Alto. So super excited about that. Uh, in terms of the PAN and uh, CDW partnership, uh, Palo Alto has been a partner for us right from the beginning, uh, really, of when we stood up the focus, uh, the focus security practice within what was Scalar and then came over with acquisition. Palo Alto has also been a partner separately with CDW, both here in Canada and the US for extended time. So within Canada, uh, CDW has had uh, the partner of the year for by revenue for the last three years running. And then in CDW US uh, last year, North Atlantic, Palo Alto, oh, sorry, CDW won the North American Partner of the Year Award. So last year was a really fantastic year for us with Palo Alto, um, just in terms of North America in general. And it just goes to show how closely we're integrated uh, with Palo Alto. So we have authorized, the authorized MSSP capability within Canada here, and you'll see a little bit about our managed services in one second. Uh, we're authorized professional services partner for uh, Palo Alto as well. So anything around your professional services. Uh, we hold diamond partnership status so again just a very close relationship built there and then we're also part uh and we're part of the north american uh Palo alto program advisory committee and i believe actually the only canadian partner that has a seat on the committee so and this just gives us the opportunity to work with Palo alto to see what is around the bend uh, ahead of us like start planning it also gives us a unique uh, opportunity to bring customer feedback around portfolio and direction. So again, just a really close partnership and why we're always really excited working with Palo Alto. On the actual resourcing side, we have a number of certs, uh, 12 de dedicated pre-sales or 12 pre-sales engineers nationally, that is the well adept in Palo Alto suite, uh, and over 20 service professional services engineers that has deep Palo Alto experience, along with uh, also the um, some trainers for Palo Alto. CDW Canada is Palo Alto's only uh, Canadian authorized training center uh, for partners. So again, uh, you know, if you need your custom training done or training, official training for Palo Alto, uh, definitely something where we can assist. And then 
The other thing that we really enjoyed with Palo Alto's uh, platform as it's been expanding and growing is integration into CDW's other expert groups. So when we look at digital transformation, cloud and other areas, it's really given us the ability uh, to integrate closely with those teams and solve more complex problems. This is the really busy slide that you've seen many times click by. Um, the real thing here is for, in terms of product professional services, uh, we really focus on just about everything in the Palo Alto suite here. And then on the managed services front today, we have a managed endpoint uh, based on Palo Alto's Cortex XDR. Uh, we have managed next generation firewall IPS. And then brand new on the list here that's in the development, um, currently being launched with two pilot customers that we're working on is actually a managed cloud Genix flavor around SD-WAN. So a lot of integration there. And if you have, if you need help with best practice assessments, configuration reviews, uh, definitely something that we'd be more than happy to help to help out with. Okay, I'm going to skip over here. So for the CDW PAN relationship, so today we have uh, guest speaker Jason uh, Georgie from Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Jason is an accomplished technology executive. So Jason has over 25 years of experience driving different forms of innovation and transformation initiatives. And it's not just local, but across global organization. Uh, Jason is currently the global field chief officer uh, Chief Technology Officer, sorry, Jason, I'll get that right eventually, uh, for Prisma Access at Palo Alto. Um, so he really understands what's happening there and like how that's being driven and put together. Uh, in past experience, uh, Jason has also had a, um, experience building out uh, a consulting practice with Zscaler and also eight years of experience at GE enabling their cloud journey. So Jason has been on your side of the fence, they've worked the customer side, see how this work, and it's also been on the, uh, the vendor side. So. Jason, welcome on board, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Theo. I appreciate that. Uh, as I'm as I'm pulling up uh, my slides here, I just wanted to take one moment to say, yeah, the partnership that we have with CDW is very strong. It is absolutely one of the best we have globally. So, um, you know, when when we're working with with CDW on a lot of these initiatives with our customers, we're really talking about some, you know, best you know, best in class type capabilities between the two organizations. So uh, really excited about our partnership and continuing to watch it grow as we move forward. So thanks a lot, Theo and team. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump in, everybody, if that's OK with you. Uh, yeah, as introduced, Jason Georgie with Palo Alto Networks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about SASE here today, which is, you know, a, really a Gartner term that they, they created about a year ago called the Secure Access Service Edge. So it's a new acronym, but the technology behind it or under it, if you will, is not any different than anything we've been talking about for years or trying to solve for for years. It's just a different application as far as how we want to apply this technology moving forward to increase our security uh, capability based on where things are evolving to, which I'll, which I'll cover. Some of these are impact moments as a result of COVID-19. Some of these have been organic shifts over time just due to the way we work, how we work, and where the resources we consume on a daily basis to do our jobs reside. So moving, moving just into the presentation, look, um, this this is really just talking about a, a shift, right? It, it's a shift of of users, whether that be a, a a person, a device, or something else, and and a cons as consumers of a service and where those services reside, and everything seems to be on this collision course of converging at the edge. Okay, so that that's anything that's got a direct internet connection at this point. So when we think about how we're working right now uh, from home, our our kids, uh, you know, that are you know, doing some mixed learning, whether they're they're at home or on campus or whatever that may be, uh, our offices with direct internet access. And if we, we think about data centers and cloud and SaaS services, everything's directly connected to the internet. You know, we've got this big edge convergence going on there. And, and with that, you know, what we're trying to boil ourselves into is this area of let's take a different approach to networking with security embedded in it. Right. Instead of it being we've got the house of, of networking and connectivity over here on one side and then we've got security as far as controls and governance and everything on the other. There's an area of of security that can combine with networking at this point, And that's what it should do. You know, and I'm not talking, you know, at, at certain types of you know, policy decision making or governance and compliance. I'm talking about you know, network security controls and an application of them. Why isn't that uh, embedded with the network at this point? You know, as as much as we've, you know, we, we understand that this is where it makes sense to do things. 
I think a lot of us are still held back a little bit by the way we, we've always been doing things instead of looking at things in a more progressive way. So hopefully this discussion a little bit uh, helps you think in terms of maybe how we move forward, right? Maybe how we start looking at things in a different way to really put ourselves on that better path and footing moving forward. So, um, as as Theo mentioned during my intro, I am the Global Field Chief Technology Officer for uh, Palo Alto Networks, uh, specifically around the Prism Access Suite. And with that, every single day, I talk to customer executives around what they're trying to do with with their estate. All right, what does their their suite look like? What are they trying to do? And and these are the conversations I'm having. Um, if I had to summarize, you know, all, almost I'd say 80% of the conversations I have in the six bullet points. This is what comes up over and over again, right? How do we increase long-term value of our security investments? Gone are the days of ha having this ability to chase tools, right? And uh, you know we've got our our incumbent technologies, and when we need to do something new, we've identified a gap in what we have in our estate. We address our incumbents. Do we have you know something that can that can tackle this problem? If not, we got to go buy something. You know, I, I think the idea of that has some relevance, but the idea of trying to find a new technology to fit in our environment no longer does. So every investment we make has to have, you know, some long-term value tied to it. We have to make sure that it's addressing as many problems as we can. And ideally, we're trying to get out of the N plus one plus one plus one type product mix and get down to an N plus one, but minus three. Right, so we've got a net benefit coming out of this. Uh, that relates directly to the next point: decrease complexity and cost of existing security and network security tools. When we when we think about what was a platform, you know, based approach, just even three years ago, there really wasn't anything. Right, I mean, you had a few vendors out there, you know, and and I'm, you know, I think <laughs> I actually think the MSSPs and the CDWs of the world did a good job of kind of, you know, masking the lack of actual pl platforms that the providers had. But when you think about like Palo and and Cisco and McAfee and Symantec and things like that, where we were really kind of going down this platform path. As recently as just yeah three four years ago, there really wasn't anything like that. You know, we what I think you saw out of a lot of us was a combination of a bunch of products that we we purchased and we tried to cobble together as best we could. Is that really a platform? No, I think the most common thing you see out of that is an invoice, right? And instead of actual technology behind it. So when we start looking at what does a platform really look like now, it is truly a converged space. It is how are we, you know, aligning technology under a single management and interface console and policy and applying it to all um, enforcement points around our network. That is that is a true platform based approach. But before that existed, you know, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to try to just go out and, and buy a platform because unless that's a best of breed type technology and, and the platform itself is handling things in a best of breed type manner, why would I sacrifice a risk security posture uh, in terms of just complying with a platform based approach? So if if the best thing I was getting was you know uh, you know a bolted together interface and and yeah that common uh, invoice coming from the vendor well I might as well continue down my best of breed path because I'm not going to expose myself to unnecessary risk but the reality is now so you know fast forward you know these three or four years and platforms do exist and they exist in a very cohesive way um and and they make a lot of sense from what we're trying to do from a network security perspective in terms of you know meeting that thing i talked about before that convergence of network and networking and security at the edge but also delivering it in a more best of breed fashion right some some real common f footing and some real real strong posturing as we go Ensuring availability and scale and minimizing unused capacity. I think this is this is more of that whole thing around COVID, right? Where, you know, five, six months ago, we bulked up our uh, VPN gateways as much as we could, our remote access gateways to get users on and working as quickly as possible. Um, but now it's like, okay, as things start to, and I do mean start to return to more normalcy, right? As people are going into the offices a little bit, not not 100% of people are going back in 100% um, of the time. There's going to be, you know, this this kind of half in, half out type thing for a while. But as as we've seen the shift go back to how things were or starting to go back in that direction, what is what happens? To all that capacity that we bought, you know, five six months ago. 
is it going to sit idle? You know, that's a challenge for a lot of organizations, especially those that are financially strained by the economic impact of the virus. You know, is this going to be an asset that we just have to sweat out at this point? So for organizations that are looking at still enhancing their environment, their remote access environment, without having to have this excess capacity, is there a way to do that? You know, and I and I think there is. So for those of you that are that have kind of been limping along a little bit, or you know, you did a you know a, a little bit of a interim step of adding some things or up, upgrading some capacity here and there to see how it goes, but you're will you're you're a little concerned about that you know, uh, future state, you know, what happens if this you know, really hits us again, or if another pandemic hits and we have to do this again, then that it really isn't a waste of capacity, but we don't always know, you know, when that's going to happen. So is there a way to get around that? Can we eliminate trust through complete visibility and control? So this is, you know, part of what Theo was saying as well, is the threatscape has evolved, right? And it can, it look, <laughs> nothing wastes an opportunity. And COVID is an opportunity for hackers as well. And, and so with that, look at what's happened, right? The the phishing campaigns, you know, um, and, and everything targeting people that are vulnerable and, and trying to play on their fears and concerns. You know, these are very real security risks. So. And, oh, and in, just to, I didn't want to gloss over that, but the reality is it's not just happening to people with their personal, you know, security at home either. You know, their their personal email accounts or as they're clicking through, you know, browser tabs and, and clicking on some clickbait type stuff and what's happening. This is happening within the enterprise environment as well. Right. I mean, there, there's there's no dis, there's no discern as far as who gets attacked. You know, this is a cast a wide net and see who who clicks that link. And so with that, what we want to do from the commercial, you know, that 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 enterprise perspective is make sure that if we are able to control all traffic between a user and their destination, including the internet, right, then we get that complete visibility. And with that visibility, we can then, you know, put certain controls in place. We can put additional security in place to do malware dec and, and ransomware uh, prevention. We can do data loss prevention. We can do all kinds of things that, that, that aren't always possible if you're not seeing all traffic. Aligning and accelerating with cloud initiatives, it's no longer enough to just be, you know, part of the cloud journey at this point. I think you have we we as practitioners need to find a way to ensure technology is going to accelerate those initiatives because look, these are these are multi-million dollar big deal moves that IT that our CIO is making on behalf of the business to modernize IT, to put our to put IT as uh, as the te technology enabler of the future. So we really need to not just be, uh, you know, eliminate our, ourselves as barriers, but how do we actually improve what's happening in that space? And then uh, automate as much as we can. You know, we talk about, you know, things like Cortex, right? And that, that is our big automation suite across Palo Alto networks. And, and automation isn't about getting hands off of keyboards because we, we just don't want people doing this anymore. It is the fact that a lot of us have open recs for these these higher level or these really detailed security analysts, whether they're SOC analysts, forensics analysts, or whatever they are. There, there aren't enough people, quality people, to fill the jobs that are out there. Everybody's looking for them because this threatscape continues to grow. That's again where CDW is a great partner because they can help offload a lot of that work from yourselves. But the reality is there are a lot of jobs out there that we just can't fill fast enough. And so if a breach happens, you can't, and you're a CISO, you can't just go to the board and say, you know what, I had five recs open and I just couldn't fill the, the seats fast enough. Yeah, that CISO is going to lose their job. That's not a good enough reason to, you know, not prevent breaches. So automation at least helps get you set up to, to automate is, or um, to to do as, met, as much as you can without that human intervention, right? So you're able to get more proactive with a response automatically, right? You're you're orchestrating things better. You're you're taking a better look through machine learning and artificial intelligence to say, yep, this is a real threat. Let's address this one. So then the people that you do have can focus on what those those big deals really are. You know, is this is this a, a nuisance or is this a critical issue that we're seeing right now? You, you can you know take what they're trying to sift through down from thousands per day to a handful per day really and and then now it's not again it, you still got the hands on the keyboards but now they're doing more important stuff for your organization so this is what I'm hearing over and over again I hope these resonate with you I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are addressing this through sassy 
so some of those shifts that I was talking about, right? Organic um, was cloud and productivity for our users. You know, SaaS adoption absolutely changed the game as far as how our users can work and be productive. But then we had some consequential shifts of COVID, right? The the fact that working from home policies will continue in some way, shape, or form. Like I said, some will go to, back to the office, not everybody, not all the time, but there will so there will be some level of this. But when those that are home have to be fully productive all of the time. Right? Let's let, let's not forget about that. This is not just giving a people a tool or two to get by for a, a few days or a week. This is if I'm home, I need to be able to do everything uh, everything that my job requires me to do. You know, and and so that means collaboration tools. That means every you know everything that we're subscribing to with Office 365, I have access to quickly. You know, and and performance is good and all of those things. And then shifting investments due to COVID-19. I think, like I said, there's an economic impact that happened with this. And one of the big things that I keep hearing is the fact that a lot of those organizations that were, you know, cloud pragmatic, let's just say, they weren't cloud first necessarily. And there were things in the data center that they didn't want to move or they felt they couldn't move for whatever reason. Um, those were those applications and services were since identified as a risk. Because everybody was trying to access those over long haul VPN connections that were pretty slow instead of over a local connection or even a wide area network connection that would at least improve the latency and performance of that application to where now that application wasn't performing well at all. And so now CIOs are saying with these things that we thought we were going to keep in the data center, we had to get them out. And, and now we have some, some new urgency behind it. Digitizing the customer experiences, right? This is how we're going to continue to evolve, you know, as, as we already were, right? Pre-COVID-19, digital transformation was already happening as a means of surviving for businesses. Well, with COVID-19, those that were impacted the least were already those that were very digital forward, you know, from mobile apps on the phone to do a lot of things um, in those digital frictionless customer experiences to, uh, you know, getting getting rid of a reliance on, on in-person presence, right? So brick and mortars and things like that. And then just simplifying and modernizing IT. This is key to everybody to make sure that our investments are sound, that we are still, we're, we're not gonna not spend on IT, but that what we do spend has to result in an overall reduction over time because you know we don't have unlimited funding to do this, yet we do need to keep things modernized in order to enable digital transformation, enable to push security to the cloud. So let's just think about, let's, now let's get into SASE specifically a little bit, right? So when we think about um, secure access use cases, what are they? Let's look across our environment and, and say, okay, now given those circumstances I just talked about before, those shifts, what do we need to do about them? So when we think about employee remote access. We're talking about we need to make sure that our approach to this is as resilient and, con and consolidated as we can. Meaning if we have two or three, four tools we use to provide a user that's not in our building access to a resource, or even sometimes when they are in the building access to certain resources, can we consolidate those down? Or do we have a bunch of solutions around because, I don't know, one doesn't work right and we specifically need this one to do something else? Thinking of like VPN versus a VDI for certain things. You know, do you really need VDI or is it because VPN isn't good enough, right? Things like that that we have to figure out. And then of course, because of so many people working remotely, increasing that scale and security. Internet and SaaS, um, how do we eliminate visibility gaps? How do we inspect all internet traffic? You know, and how do we apply data loss and threat mitigation to all traffic types? When we look at what the technologies have been thus far, you know, and I'll just call it out, a proxy-based technology, web proxies are limited in their traffic inspection ability for internet traffic. It's, it's really web, secure web, FTP, and DNS. And now, there's a whole lot of web traffic out there. There's a lot of DNS. DNS is what uh, you know, command and control calls and, and botnets call over, so it's a big deal. But when you think about web traffic on the internet today, it's 35 to 40% of all internet traffic. A lot of it's streaming, a lot of it is real-time protocols and things like that that pro proxies just don't even look at. So if you're relying on proxy-based technology for your internet security, your internet gateways, and, inter and let's just say proxies only, you're not seeing 70% of the traffic going in and out of your environment. Um, network transformation, you know, this is a direct internet access from branches and things like that. How do we improve performance of cloud and SaaS? This is where things like SD-WAN really help, right? They can be 
really smart at the layer seven uh, as far as application identification, what, what the application requirements are as far as jitter um, and latency sensitivity outage tolerance and things like that that SD-WAN can really help us through. And then uh, simplifying the branch security stack, right? I mean, all of us want to figure out a way to do better, you know, better or get better performance to cloud and SaaS from the branch, but re replicating our security stacks out in each one is not feasible, right? So how do we make sure we have the same level of security and posture no matter where the access is coming from? And third parties. You know, third parties are incredibly critical to our environment today. We can't we can't survive without them, right? But there's a, a, a it's a business decision to include that risk in our environment, right? Because we don't control those endpoints most of the time. And so, what do we have to do then? We have to inspect that traffic coming to and from that third party in line. You know, and so how do we do that appropriately? How do we make sure we're putting our best control forward? So just looking at how we we figure out what to do with these secure access use cases, this is where we then start to figure out what is the approach? What are we trying to make sure that we can really solidify ourselves around? Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide because I, I kind of talk to these as we go, but it's just an idea of really, you know, when we think about each of those use cases, what are some of the technology and tools we apply to, to solve for each one of them? But then the meat of it is, let's move on from a product-based approach to a platform-based approach. And what does this look like? It means going from VPNs and secure web gateways, CASBs on their own and all this stuff to secure access to everything. How about just let's figure out one, one suite, one platform, one technology that if we say we have a user somewhere, anywhere, and they're accessing a resource anywhere, whether it's data center, cloud, SaaS, or web, can we just have one thing that provides that access securely? Yes, you can. And how do we get away from one product per use case, that one-to-one -one ratio into that platform-based approach? How do we go from you know, measuring infrastructure capacity and planning for those things, like planning for the unpredictable, right? So where we're overspending or we're rolling the dice and underspending and hoping we don't get bit by it to leveraging cloud scale instead, right? What are these services we can start to move to cloud services that have that scalability? And then managing infrastructure to things as a service, right? This is what IT has been doing for years now because it makes sense. Nobody wants to manage infrastructure. It's been something we've done as a necessary evil essentially for a long time. But the business itself doesn't quote unquote run on infrastructure. It runs on the applications and services that the infrastructure you know, lifts up. So if we can figure out a way around that and just focus on the core, which is the services that are important to run, then we can look at this in a different way. So that's what SASE is all about. It's saying, hey, why don't we take a different approach to this? Users are working from everywhere. They have been before COVID. You know, when you think about our employees that are on the go, traveling at home, you know, work-life balance and everything else, you know, and then where the resources have been shifting to, cloud and SaaS for the last eight years. You know, all of a sudden, you know, we, we see this these light bulbs going off and saying, hey, it's not just about networking and not just about security at the edge. What if, what if we converge them? Because when we start thinking about that medium that is connecting you know, those users or consumers of the service to the service themselves, it's the internet. And the reality is the internet is an uncontrollable network, both from a, you know, a, a control and, and transport side, but also a security side. So the next best thing you can do then is control transit through it. So what are the tools you have to leverage it effectively and apply things like QoS and things like that, but then also embed security with it. So, so that's what SASE is meant to talk about. And, and Gartner got this right. You know, a lot of people take what Gartner says with a grain of salt. I think they were absolutely right on this one because this is a direction things have been going for a long time. Now it's time to formalize it. So this is what Palo Alto Networks, um, our, our, so Prism Access is our productized SASE, but this is how we approach it from our security uh, component perspective, as well as the network perspective. So security is on the top in the gray box. You got all the things you'd expect out of a world-class security suite, like SSL decryption, sandboxing, DNS security, firewalling, zero trust network access, DLP. And then on the bottom, we have those networking capabilities, right? QoS, SD-WAN type capabilities that are provided, you know, through our, our recent acquisition, CloudGenix, which has just been a huge boon to us. You know, when we talk about fit as far as technology goes, we as, at Palo have been focusing on layer seven based approaches to security for years. Uh, Palo Alto Networks uh, PA series and PanOS firewalls were the first next generation firewall on the market. 
And the whole reason was because, you know, our found our founder and then the product teams shortly thereafter realized that, you know what, it's not about connecting networks anymore. It's going to be about application and user based parameters. And with that, how do we shift everything to layer seven? Well, CloudGenix from their uh, SD-WAN approach, same exact thing, right? Everything's about layer seven. It's less about layer three and four. It's about you know, every every layer up to seven. And so when you start thinking about it in that respect, you've got this really good cohesive capability there that we can take advantage of. But then things like IPsec and SSL VPN for connectivity, you know, whether that be a branch or a client running on an endpoint or a brow or browser-based access to everything else like that. So now we're taking this approach of get the users to their destination and then embed the security with it. And that's what SASE is all about. Uh, and and so, so, like I said, Prism Access is part of, um, or is our productized SASE, but Prism Access is our cloud delivered firewall. And I, I say that happily, you know, I, I don't think firewall is a dirty word as some people have uh, in recent years, but when you think about what a firewall is meant to do, um, it's meant to protect our most critical assets. And that is still true today. When we have crown jewels, when we have intellectual property, whether it be in data center or cloud, we are securing at user access to that through some type of firewall technology, whether it's a appliance-based, a VM-based, VM a container-based, doesn't matter. It's still a firewall. And so when we're talking about what is securing our most critical assets and it's firewall-based technology, that's what we wanted to apply to the cloud-delivered service that is Prism Access as well. We did not want our customers to, to compromise or to have to think, well, okay, I really like what you guys secure as far as user access to these applications or services in the data center or in my public cloud instance, but you know, for everything else, I've got to kind of take a step back and use this cloud-delivered you know, uh, other security technology, whatever it may be. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to say, you, you built this policy that you trust, your user ID and app ID policy that you've trusted for all these other things. Why don't we just scale that you know, and let you consume it to solve the other use cases like branch access and mobile user access? So it makes it more cohesive and it makes it integrated because everything's managed through our centralized management platform, which is Panorama, and, and you can apply a single policy to all of these enforcement points. So now, no matter what your network security needs are or how they're evolving over time, we've got a solution to help you with it, right? And it's, a, it's cohesive and it's integrated. So it's, really, it's a really powerful way of changing up the game. So this is what we're doing, right? We're consolidating those use cases I talked about. So getting back to the points I made before about long-term investments and doing more with less and rationalizing the tools and estates. If we think about those four use cases I talked about, remote worker access, secure internet and SaaS, uh, network transformation, secure WAN edge, and third parties, how, we have a platform that can consolidate these down into that single approach at the edge, but it's not a big bang approach. Let me be clear about that. We're not advocating for you, you're ripping and replacing everything today or tomorrow, but all of you probably have some type of use case or compelling event going on today. I need to replace my VPN or I need to scale it up or I need to improve security behind it or whatever, right? I need to replace my proxy or web gateway. You know, whatever that is, you start with that today. And then over time, this is where you start to extract that longer term value. You start consolidating other use cases into the SASE platform. So, okay, you start with VPN replacement today. In six months, you've got to replace your proxy. So you move your swig into Prism Access. And two months after that, you're starting your WAN transformation project and, and with SD-WAN. So you start rolling out SD-WAN and moving your security uh, heavy lifting from the branch to the cloud. And then your third party access shifts in. This is where you get to that unified SASE approach which I like to call SASE entitlement, which I'll show here. So when we think about what it means to get to SASE entitlement, right? Think of all the things that go into our, our tools at the bottom, right? So it, this is just a representation. It's not, you know, these could replace these with your tools as needed. But the idea to, you know, to the left uh, on the chart are, is still the same. You've got multiple policies to administer today. You've got management effort, you know, across multiple consoles and interfaces. You've got a total cost of ownership that if you do one for one product replacement and updates and refreshes over the next you know few years, you know, that's only going to go up. You know, I, I'm I'm yet to see a technology that improves with age and then goes down in price. <laughs> so what you paid for something two, three, four, five years ago that you're looking to refresh or renew now is only going to cost you more, 
right? And so your total cost of ownership for your estate is only going to go up over time. What if that could be reduced, right? Um, your visibility, you know, when we talk about all of these tools, do we have integrated visibility, truly integrated visibility? We're doing the best we can with our SIM most of the time, but it's it, these are different log feeds, formats, and languages that are all going to this thing. And so we're doing a lot of manual effort. Scalability, do we have it? Because we have a lot of on-prem deployments, we probably don't. Right. So when we talk about what a SASE can do, as you start consolidating those capabilities, like I talked about the last slide, the policies, the number of policies to administer naturally goes down, right? Because you're consolidating them down into that, that single platform that's solving multiple use cases. Therefore, your management effort goes down, right? Multiple consoles and interfaces down to one. Total cost of ownership. As you start to collapse and fold these, these you know, point products into the platform, those get shut down and the dependent and the dependent infrastructure around it gets shut down your tco go, can go down pretty significantly you know depending on what your environment looks like and on the upside your visibility goes up your scalability goes up because it's a cloud delivered service and the, that's when you reach that sassy entitlement getting your value curve to go in the right direction so some key differentiators, and I'm not going to read a slide, um, but you know when you start looking at what makes Prism Access different than others, right? Because a lot of a lot of companies out there are raising their hand and saying we're SASE two or SASE two. They are adopting a more platform-based approach, like I talked about. Like some of their approaches to platforms are more real than they were three or four years ago. But you still have to look at what the differentiation is between them, right? What sets them apart? Prism Access, like I said, it's a cloud-delivered firewall. And, and with that, there are no dependencies on what it can or cannot inspect. Very important for our customers, right? Whereas, you know, proxy-based technologies, they don't inspect everything, including things like Office 365. You know, so that's a, that's a gap. So unless you're using Microsoft's native tools plus a CASB, you know, you're really not doing inline inspection of that of that traffic at all. And I'm yet to see a customer raise their hand and say, you know what, my OneDrive or SharePoint traffic is not important. I don't care about data loss or anything, right? So you want something that can inspect all traffic all the time. That's what a firewall capability can do. Zero trust access. You know, when we talk about zero trust, there's a whole lot of vendors out there talking about, well, we do zero trust network access as well. Um, you know, and, and, but how do you do it, right? Are you zero trust of the user or are you zero trust of the user and the session itself? Really, when it comes down to the software defined perimeter market and, and that set of vendors, they do a nice job in terms of validating user and device context and posture. The issue is from there, they're pretty hands off. Right? They don't look at the traffic once it's established. So if you think about an insider threat, you know, I'm Jason over here and I'm by policy, I have access to a whole bunch of resources because I'm a good employee. All of a sudden now so I'm, I'm a rogue employee or somebody has compromised my credentials, right? And, and so now all of a sudden that policy still works, right? I'm, I'm the, from that policy engine's perspective, I still am who I am. What's stopping anything bad from happening? Unless you're doing inline secure inline inspection and security of that traffic, nothing is stopping it, right? So you got to take a different look at zero trust access and what it means to you and your environment. Customer isolation, another key thing. This is less on the threat security side, more on the risk reduction and business continuity side. We provide customer isolation throughout our cloud. You know, that's from both the data plane perspective, but also the virtualized infrastructure perspective, making sure that there is no impact from one customer to another if one has a high bandwidth event or if multiple have a high bandwidth event. We're not knocking people offline or saturating data centers to the point where, you know, some customers can't connect and they've got to be diverted to others. So we make sure that we have that full isolation capability, making sure that you know, whatever data center you connect to because it's best for your business, that's the data center you can always connect to. You know, there's, you're not going to have, you know, these constraints that, that exist with some of the others out there. So I want to get back to Zero Trust real quick as I start to wrap up the presentation. Um, zero Trust Access, you know, let's, let's look at it this way from, from that user trust versus session trust point of view. If I think back to when I was traveling, which was weekly uh, for my job, um, let's just say I'm, I'm, I just arrived to the airport. I've got bags with me and I go up to the border or TSA officer, depending on what country I'm in. And I present my boarding pass and ID. They put the boarding pass down on the Penta scanner. Green check comes up. They look at my ID, look at my face, ask me a question or two. Okay. We've validated who you are. You're a good known traveler. 
Now they say, off you go to your plane. Nothing else to do. Well, for a second, I might think that's pretty cool and convenient. You know, that's pretty easy. But about a, <laughs> that very next second is going to be terror because it's like, well, wait a minute. You don't know what's in my bags, right? I've got a backpack on my back. I've got a laptop bag in my arm, whatever it is. And I, if you did this to the person in front of me, you're going to do it to the person back of me. I don't know what they've got in their bags. You know, this is, this, this is, these are still scary times. What we advocate for, and this is across our, our, our firewall capability, is not just doing the user check. It's then forcing them to put the bag on the scanner and walk through the metal detector or body scanner too. That is the payload inspection, right? This is what sets Palo Alto Network's approach to zero trust network access apart from everybody else. Because at all that, all those software defined perimeter companies, and it doesn't matter who they are, because they're all the same. Those cloud brokers are just brokers. They're not inspection inspection capability at all. So, you know, everybody in that SDP category does only the stuff on the on the left here, that that user validation device context and and posture. We do the inspection too. You know, and that's incredibly important when it comes to the insider threat. Less about, you know, maybe things externally cloaking an application from the internet and things like that, but that insider threat and how you prevent data loss and malware uploads, frankly, uh, from rogue insiders. So uh, quickly on our architecture, you know, look, it's a, our architecture is cloud delivered. It's, we leverage public cloud services. We did not build a cloud to deliver Prisma access. We wanted to broker something that you could take advantage of. So with that, our public cloud, uh, our uh, services act as a monolithic, but multi-cloud environment. So we've got over 120 gateways globally available to all customers and they're in 76 countries. So when we advertise our number of gateways, if if you need them all, they're all yours. You know, it's not like we advertise 150, but you actually, given the cloud, you would be provisioned to get 60, 65, or 70. That may be enough for some organizations, depending on how regionalized you are. But for our big global companies and our multinationals, you know, that the number of gateways does make sense. Firewall-based architecture, like I said, it's important and why it's important. Single pass, same thing that we have on our PA and VM series firewalls. It's a single pass security scanning architecture. We do inspect, so SSL decryption and inspection at scale. Customer isolation, like I talked about, multi-tenancy from a management point of view. We do manage our cloud through APIs, threshold monitoring, and things like that. And then cloud scale, we do scale out and back as needed based on customer demand events. So if everything's humming along just fine, everything stays where it is. If you have a high bandwidth event, such as a software push or a webcast or something like that, our APIs are managing or are monitoring your instance and as bandwidth thresholds or throughput thresholds are, are seen and get encroached, we increase your instance at no cost, no anything. It just happens as part of the service. And then when the event's over, we descale back. So we make sure that we're efficiently using the cloud in a sustainable way. A quick view of our presence, you know, like I said, all over the world, no regional surcharges anywhere, including Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, which is, you know, a real pain for, for a lot of the other uh, others in the space, you know, that have built their clouds and they're provisioning their own tier one bandwidth. You know, it's very expensive. And so with that, they have to pass it along to their customers somehow because we leverage a service that includes bandwidth and the, the back end networking and everything uh, as part of those public cloud providers, we have no regional surcharges, no, regardless of where the users are in the country. So quick look at how it looks from a edge interconnect perspective, right? Everything on the left are users in the edge. We've got everything on the right, which is the resource that they're trying to consume. And Prisma Access Security Cloud is that is that intermediary, right? It's that interconnect that's not just connecting them at that edge point, but also embedding security uh, as it happens, right? And with that, because we're using those public cloud services, like I said, we are able to offer SLAs on, on, uh, on for SaaS performance, uh, but then our, our single pass architecture for security scanning is also SLA backed. So very strong, very resilient, robust as far as cloud networking and architecture goes. So as as I as I wrap up here, um, keeping things simple, right? And that I've tried to do that from the beginning. You know, address some concerns instead of thinking about how we've been doing things all along. How could we do it moving forward? And then so we can't just flip a switch. So how do we get there? But let's look at it this way: Where's the user? The users are anywhere at this point. 
globally, right? And and that, that means just that, they're anywhere. What are they accessing? They're accessing resources in the data center or cloud, SaaS or web. Those are the key four areas that, they're, that our resources that we provide them exist. So what kind of traffic's in that? That's what you have to look at. What is the traffic going to those locations? That determines what type of inspection you need to have happen. If this is only web across the board, you know, proxy-based technologies might be okay. The reality is it's not. Cloud and data center, it's not. And that's why a lot of those security companies out there also have a product for internet and SaaS security and another one for data center and cloud security. So what's the best solution? A firewall-based SASE, right? Because it's one platform accessing all resources. You get that complete visibility because all traffic is coming to the cloud first and then the cloud's routing it from there. Demand-based scale happens, right? Like I talked about. And then um, zero trust access is just built in. It's been built into what we've been doing for over five years now. So this is what I'd like you to imagine, right? So instead of it, uh, instead of thinking about how your network is constructed and, and its topology of a hub and spoke, you know, as far as you know everything connecting to a data center and then out, think of the Prism Access Security Cloud as your new hub, where everything is a spoke off of it: your users, your data centers, third parties, and contractors. I've illustrated the cloud services to be internal, right? Because of the ability to leverage tier one peering on the backbone, uh, these, these tier one peering points for cloud and SaaS services due to performance and fiber connectivity to them. But you're, in any case, your users connect up to the closest possible gateway to them, and then they leverage the cloud own fiber network for transit to the destination. Only traffic destined for the data center goes to it. Right, so you ingress in, you're ingressing at a firewall, not a VPN concentrator or some other security broker. Uh, it's, it's a layer seven firewall that you connect to. So all of that challenging and posture checking and everything else is being done in an air gap type way. So then only clean traffic is going to your data center from there, or it's going to the cloud or SaaS service. And that's leveraging again, the cloud's tier one uh, peering arrangements with these, these cloud and SaaS providers so that you're, right, you're ingressing, writing their fiber backbone, and then getting the handoff to the cloud or SaaS provider. And that's what gives us the ability to provide an SLA around the performance for these services. And then you've got web services as well, right? Web security, web gateway, all of your SSL decryption, malware sandboxing, DLP, URL and content filtering, all built into the service as well. Um, and then the auto scaling, like I talked about. So a big event happens, we scale up as needed. And then when the event's over, we descale and give that, that scale back to the cloud. So this is what your network could look like, you know, down the road, right? It's very efficient, it's cloud forward, it's it's taking advantage of, you know, uh, cloud services that, that put your footing in terms of your cloud journey on, on a better plane. So some key questions to ask your SASE providers, you start evaluating technologies, right? What are the points of presence? What are the actual number of data centers I have available to my instance versus what's advertised? When I get provisioned onto your cloud, what does it look like to me? What, how, do you, how do you scale your environment, right? Are you, are you using cloud, with, cloud services with auto scale? Or do you have, did you build your cloud with a bunch of data centers that now you have to scale up manually, right? And, and so if you do have a capacity issue, I'm waiting on you to deliver services, you know, to that data center. Customer isolation, how are you making sure my bandwidth is isolated, that I'm not gonna be impacted by other customers or performance for performance reasons? Is a platform truly unified? Can I use it to access every service that I need to access? Or are you gonna have one, one service that is, you know, like I said, internet and SaaS security over here, but then I've got another service that's uh, data center and cloud over there. Now that may be one one user client, but it's two policies for IT to manage, two interfaces for IT to manage. You know, it's not simplifying your life a whole lot. Performance SLAs, do they exist? Are they financially backed? And and if you don't have performance SLAs to SaaS, why not? Because everybody's cloud delivered at this point, what, what, why wouldn't you have an SLA around SaaS performance? And then traffic inspection, being able to inspect everything across all ports and protocols. What you do inspect, you know, should be complete. What you don't is up to your policy, not a vendor's limitations. So we're, we're going to help you to deliver better outcomes. And I think this is in conjunction with CDW, right? You know, you work with both of us. We're going to help you reduce that risk. We're going to give you complete visibility at scale. Uh, we're going to prevent you from having to make compromises between performance and security. 
agility is going to increase, whether that's part of what you do by consolidating your estate or leveraging somebody like like CDW to manage the service for you. You know, it simplifies your operations, letting you focus on your core business. And then, of course, improving user experience. This is key for everybody. Can we get that consistent security with SLA back, uh, back performance to cloud and SaaS? Because that's what's going to make our users more productive, keep them from circumventing IT controls that are in place today. So thank you all. I do appreciate it. And I wanted to leave time for questions, which I think we do at this point. I think we've got about seven minutes or so uh, for questions here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jason. So let me just quickly see. Um, Jason, like while, while, while we have a look there, I actually have a question for you on this one, sure. um, if you don't mind. So uh, can you, so I've actually been talking to a few customers, right? Looking at, um, Cortex XDR and how that ties into SASE around the data lake. Um, can you maybe, if it's possible, can you give me a quick comment? Because I keep getting the questions like, with with data lake and Cortex XDR, and as I'm tying um, this together, and I apologize, it's a little bit off Prisma, but I get this a lot when we combine it with the Prisma access conversation. Um, yep. How like how what is the best integration to a sim, and do I even still need a sim? What is that relationship between the product sets? It's a good, it's a really good question and it does come up a lot. So I have no problem answering it. Um, you know, really the benefit of, of, so Cortex and, and, and Strata. So the firewalling capability plus Prisma, you know, the cloud security capabilities, um, on their own, they're all meant to play together in some way, shape or form. Cortex though, is, is that kind of center of the universe when it comes to the Palo suite and portfolio. And the reason for that is because of things like, yes. We have the data lake, which can, which is that logging repository for all services that can log there. All, so all Palo services can log there, um, plus some other third parties that we've integrated as well. Um, but from there, when you think about what XDR does, so what we're trying to gain in terms of visibility and, and to better set us up for automation, like I was talking about before, is telemetry. And so if we have enforcement points, which are firewalls across our environment, right? Enforcement and censoring points, and we've got endpoints that are running the XDR Pro agent. So yeah, endpoints, you know, uh, user devices, servers, whatever they are. And we get, we, we these things are running, watching and alerting and sending all of that back to, you know, the data lake and to, and from there, our XOR capability, formerly Domisto, right? The security orchestration automation response. First of all, yeah, is it's all getting into the data lake. That's a machine learning based capability. So it's it's seeing what's coming in and it's rationalizing it from the beginning and it's getting smarter. The more it sees, the more it understands that this is a, a benign anomaly. This is malicious, you know, we, action needs to be taken. And then based on some playbook automation, how does XOR play into that? So when we talk about, you know, that, that cohesiveness of how, how everything can log together, so now we've got that that familiar language that everything's speaking, right? From formats of logs and, and things like that to then taking action. That then depends on what you want to do. Yes, that could feed a SIM because a SIM is is collecting data from so much, right? You could have it collecting things from your 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 compute services and other areas of your environment that really don't play in into what we do. Um, so yes, you could take you could take that that SIM approach as your overall enterprise logging repository and, and shift stuff there as well for, for correlation across the enterprise. Or you could actually start to figure out a way to get out of your SIM. You, you absolutely can do that. And that's what the data lake is actually meant to do for those security focused customers that, you know, we, we do have the ability to absorb those additional technologies into it and start to maybe look at how we can get away from from SIM based technologies over time. As an example, Palo no longer has a SIM. Uh, we use we use Cortex Data Lake as ours now because obviously <laughs> we're using our own products. We do have some third party capabilities in there too that we've built integrations for. But over time, the goal was always to you know leverage our own platform or our, yeah, the Cortex platform uh, to replace our SIM. And so customers can do that too. It just depends on what all you're logging to it. Um, and, and what integrations we have with it to determine how much of it you could shut down and or replace. Perfect, thank you, it's really good. Um, what is some of the challenges or mindsets that you see that you still, you perhaps have to overcome 
with customers when you're positioning uh, Prisma Access? What, what's sort of, sort of the, the number one and two uh, points that you need to handle and talk to and address? Yeah, the first one is um, the first one is really around a little apprehension still of moving security services to the cloud, giving up you know that that ability to touch a a firewall or a box. The but you know everybody knows that it's the right thing to do because of the direction things are going, but there's still that concern of I'm trusting you with my security. So we re, we make sure that we try to you know calm that as much as we can with our certifications, right? Our our ISO 27001 certifications, all all the things that we do to make sure our cloud is secure and how it's being handled and managed is secure, right? We use public cloud services like I said. So then it's a matter of okay, we we're using something that's not, you know, running in Bob's basement. It's it's actually a pretty robust cloud capability that our security is is leveraging essentially a giant VPC for. Um, so we've got the certifications around that that we try to to give assurances to. The the next piece is how do I not screw this up, right? And I, like like I said before, a lot of companies raise their hand and say we do this, we do that, you know, and it, on paper it looks like Palo. And so when they're looking at differentiation, it's like how do I know that you're actually different than than somebody else? Because on paper you look the same. And so what I what I encourage them to do is kind of like I had up there, you know, what are the five or six things you need to figure out about what you want your SASE to do and then ask the pointed questions, right? How do you actually do this? Because, you know, when not everybody is actually equal, but they sound equal, it's it's very confusing to the customer to know what's real or not about what they're buying. And we just want to be transparent. We want to say, look, this is how we operate. Right. This is what we have. Um, do your homework, you know, ask the, ask very specific questions and don't, don't, and a, a lot of folks like to rely on their RFP or RFQ or whatever it is. Those are very granular questions around how to do something, but just ask broader, how does the architecture work and function? You know, so that would be another thing, you know, just to you know, give a good outline of the architecture itself. Right. Perfect. Well, excellent. Well, Jason, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Ben, thank you so much. And thank you to the participants. We're right on the hour there. Um, what I just wanted to quickly ask is for people joining us tonight, I know tonight is the cooking se session. Um, if you, for whatever, whatever reason, did not have time to collect ingredients and you just want to dial in and hang tight with us and probably watch the shenanigans as uh, my, myself try to cook something without burning down the kitchen, uh, feel free to hop on and just come join us, even if you're not participating in the um, the actual cooking event. It would just be really nice to have you on there, um, even if it's just for a part of the evening, so we can connect and close everything out. Um, but other than that, I'm going to hand people's days back to them and enjoy lunch for Eastern time. And Jason, again, just for you and the team, thank you so much. This was this was really fantastic. I really enjoyed the summary on this, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tonight. Thanks for having us, Theo. Appreciate it.